Hello, friends. Welcome back to the Nope Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Suzanne Kohlberg. Today, I'm welcoming a guest, Jeff Patterson, and we're going to chat about meditation. And before I introduce Jeff and ask him all the things, I personally have a love-hate relationship with meditation. Like, it's kind of like exercise. It feels good when I do it, but then it's just another thing I've got to, got to like add to my plate or remember to do, or it's one of the easiest things to get cut when the unexpected happens, like the kids are sick or we're running late or, you know, you're in traffic and you just think, oh yeah, I'll, I'll do it later. And later becomes tomorrow and tomorrow becomes next week. And that can become like six months. So I'm really, really excited to hear the wisdom that you have for us today, Jeff. So without further ado, when you speak about meditation so that we're all like on the same page, what do you mean by it? When I refer to the meditative arts, I'm putting together things from sitting meditation, standing meditation, movement meditation practices like Qigong or Tai Chi or yoga, anything that involves that meditative state where we don't have to think externally. As we start to build a practice around meditation, we are going to use things from what I call ritual practices, active practices, and philosophical practices. Ritual practice is when we set time aside every day and we do a little bit of training. And as you said, you know, it's easy to get busy and and kind of caught up with the day's to-dos. And so you don't need to retire to a cave and meditate for the rest of your life. But if you could be consistent with a daily ritual, you can get so much more out of the practice than doing it like a hobby that you visit once or twice a week. And so I usually recommend to people that, you know, to try to find time in the morning, you know, maybe right before or after you brush your teeth, where it just becomes part of the way you are when you when you wake up in the morning. And by doing this consistently, you'll see a lot of benefits from the practice. And then we also have what I call active practices. And these are great tools because you can use them throughout the day to help keep that awareness level up and to keep that focus and be kind of living that meditation lifestyle rather than doing, you know, the hobby that you're doing once in a while. And, and these active practices can be things like a simple two minutes where you count out 10 breaths or maybe doing some spinal rotations or a simple movement practice. And if you do that five, 10 times throughout the day in correlation with your ritual practice that you have going on in the morning, now you're revisiting that place of stillness, you know, 10 times a day. And this really builds up momentum and it starts to expand your awareness and through time, it really leads to a lot of benefits by incorporating the practice. I love how you mention two minutes, like five to 10 times a day, because as you were talking, I was thinking like while you're waiting for the jug to boil, that you, you've got a couple of minutes there, you know, while if you're pegging out your laundry, like just pause before you come inside. Like one of my favorite things to do, <laughs> this sounds really weird, but I, d I don't enjoy laundry as a chore, but when I first walk outside, I put the basket down and I just like face the sun and close my eyes. And I really enjoy that, like enjoying the sun on my face, enjoying the fresh air, enjoying being outside and nobody asking me for anything. And, you know, that could be a time that I could incorporate the the other practice that you said. So there was the ritual. What was the name for the second one? Sorry, I should, should write it, these down. It was an active practice and yes. these could be... And these could be many different things, you know, from a breathing exercise to a standing meditation to a movement practice. There's lots of different things that we do. And as you start understanding how to use some of these different practices, you'll see that we can strategically use them through the day to get different outcomes. So maybe we're feeling a little depleted or we're feeling a little bit stressed out. We can do different practices to help find balance in those times when we're a little bit in an imbalanced state. So if someone's listening to this and they're like, I like the idea, but I have no idea where to start. Because as you said, like, I loved how you said, you don't need to go to, you know, somewhere and sit on a 
couch and light a candle and close your eyes and be away from everyone. Because I think sometimes, you know, people do, they go to retreats or they go away. There's nothing wrong with those things. They're amazing. But when you are at a retreat or away from your everyday life and you start yoga or you start meditation or you start something for yourself, and I have done this, and then you say to yourself, when I get home, I'm going to keep this going. And then the second you get home, all the day-to-day stuff is immediately back, plus the backlog of stuff that nobody took care of while you were away. And then you're just like, oh, and they can kind of become like retreat junkies who just want to go to retreats, but never actually integrate this into their day-to-day life. So someone's listening is like, okay, I kind of, I get the idea, but like, where would I even start? What would you recommend for them? I think one of the most important things to consider is trying to find somebody that can help guide you because meditation, you know, I've been studying the meditative arts for 36 years and I'm still just a student. I'm learning all the time. You know, it's a very deep practice and there's a lot involved. It's kind of like, you know, I always tell people to think about if you have never watched the game of basketball before and you don't know anything about it. And I take you to a basketball court and I give you a ball and I say, go play basketball. Think about how good you're going to be. You're going to be horrible. Now think about if I give you a coach and he teaches you how to dribble and how to use footwork and how to do strategy and how to play off your teammates and how to run up the court, all of these different things in a fairly short amount of time, you can learn the game. Meditation is no different. If you have somebody helping you out, you can accomplish a lot more in a short amount of time. And You know, as you mentioned earlier, we're all busy. We've all got a lot going on in our lives. I've literally seen people waste 10, 15 years of their life following these practices and realizing they're never even close to the beginner stage in the practice because they didn't have any direct guidance in what they're doing. And, you know, 15 years, that's a good chunk of your life. And so finding somebody to help you is number one. Number two is... If you're inspired by the idea of meditation, think about why you want to take on the practice. Because as you mentioned, you know, tomorrow's going to come around and that alarm clock's going to go off and you're going to think, I'll just hit the snooze button. I'll get up. I'll do it the next day. And, you know, that never comes, as you said. And the idea is, is we want to have those reasons you know, maybe we want to improve our health. We want to work with the stress and anxiety in our life. Maybe we want to be around longer to watch our grandkids grow up. Whatever it is, find those reasons why. So when that alarm clock does go off tomorrow, you can get up and do the practice. And the last thing I'd like to mention on that for somebody new is find an area in meditation that helps you accomplish what you want to do but it's also fun for you. For example, some people have a very difficult time sitting for 20 minutes. And for somebody like that, I might recommend doing a Qigong set or a Tai Chi form, something where they can get some movement engaged, but still get a lot of the same benefits. And as you start to integrate these different things into your life, then your repertoire can open up and you can have a lot of other variables depending on what you want to get out of the practice. I think that was brilliant. Like to summarize, find support. Like, as you said, if you were introduced to a sport that you knew nothing about, your learning journey would be a lot more complicated than someone who has been there. And I love how you said you've been doing this 36 years and still consider yourself a student. Like that's just gold. Secondly, remind yourself of why you got into it because many of us, like, you know, I don't know about anyone else, but I've never met a bright, shiny object I didn't like. So sometimes it'll be like, oh, this looks cool. And then, you know, when you get to the actual day-to-day of doing it, like as you said, when the alarm goes off and it's like, eh, no, meditation wasn't the thing. (laughs) I'm already looking for the next thing. But if it's like, what are you tying it to? Your long-term health, um, you know, peace of mind, reducing stress or anxiety, wanting to see grandkids, like whatever you're getting into the thing for to remind yourself of that regularly. And that can go for so many things. If you want to start a podcast, write a book, run your own business, like that little reminder of what am I doing this for big picture? Because in the moment, no matter what you see on social media, that's beautifully curated and looks 
like perfect. I don't know anybody's life who on the day to day is like that. And the third point you made, I've gotten lost now. It was help. It was reminding self while you're into it. What was the third point? Oh, the style. Try the style. Like I loved how you said, I cannot sit still. Uh, if you watch my show, sometimes people will say to me the fact that I shift around or the fact that I move my eyes, it really bothers some people. I'm like, well, then that's why it's video and audio or maybe I'm not the person for you. That's okay. But I'm not a person who sits still. And when I was doing meditation practices before and people said, have you tried Qigong? Didn't even know what it was. Tried to Google it, did not start it with a Q. So, <laughs> um, and, you know, Tai Chi, yoga, like finding something that suits your lifestyle or the way that you are. And then over time, maybe the other practices, you know, can start to be, but finding your gateway into it that suits you rather than going, well, that's not for me because I can't sit still or I can't stare at a candle. Um, I personally have never enjoyed completely silent meditations. Maybe I will one day. I'm open to it, but I always like guided or some sort of prompt or some way into it to focus on rather than I know some people will just sit silently. My like, you do you, but <laughs> that for me would be abject horror but then again I can start with a shorter period of time I remember someone saying why don't you just do 15 seconds I was like well, I can do that you can do anything for 15 seconds but if you told me I had to sit for an hour then we'd have issues but you know your third point of try different things and different styles and different approaches and see what works for you like really random but what came to mind is something like a toothbrush we don't even think we all have our preferred brand or our preferred bristles or our preferred brushing technique. And we just do that. We don't think, Oh, I only have to do use this toothbrush because whatever, and whatever practice that you're doing can be similar. You can try them out and find, you know, what resonates with you. So my next question is how did you come to meditation? Like what was your entry into it? So I was turned on to the meditative arts in a bit of a roundabout way in that when I was a younger guy, around 19, 20 years old, I was very much into Western boxing. And I used to go to a boxing gym just a few blocks down the street from my academy here. And at a boxing gym, I'm not sure if the listeners maybe know how their classes are run, but it's not like a traditional fitness class. Usually in a boxing gym, you might have as many as three, four, or five different coaches in the gym, and each one of those coaches might have a handful of fighters that they work with. It's not like 30 people come to a class and everybody trains with the same coach. Well, at this one gym that I was at, there was a very well-known coach who had actually created national and world champion level fighters, and I really wanted to get to spend some time with him. He was an amazing coach, and so... I would always show up at the gym when I knew he was going to be there and I'd work really hard and try to let him notice me and, and stand out a little bit and let him know that I wanted to spend some time with him. Well, after following him around for about three or four months, he finally started showing me a few things and helping me out. And then it was only maybe two or three weeks after I started working with him when he said something to me that changed my life forever in that he said, you know, if you really want to be a good boxer, you should start doing Tai Chi and meditation. And at the time, I'm this young guy thinking that, you know, isn't that for like old people in the park? How's that going to help me be a better fighter? And um, I had a lot of respect for him, though, and I started taking on the practice. And it's changed my life in so many ways. And through the years, I've had thousands of students come through the academy and I have literally heard hundreds of stories on how the meditative arts has positively influenced people's lives. And that's kind of what's made me so passionate about getting this information out there and writing my last couple books and creating my online program is because I want to share this information with as many people as I can. I love that. And I love your, like the thought it, it can go to, isn't this for old people? We recently went on a cruise and in the morning they had Tai Chi, which I enjoyed and my kids are like oh mommy that's just for old people and I was like no Tai Chi is incredible uh it's, it's interesting doing it on a moving cruise ship though yeah. <laughs> anything's fun so you mentioned you've written a couple of books now I know you've got a new book out well written, your most recent book is about yielding so what is that so yielding <clears throat> to me is one of the coolest concepts in all of the the meditative and martial arts and 
the idea of yielding has been around for generations in the martial arts and the I've broken it down into three categories. We have physical yielding, mental yielding, and emotional yielding. Physical yielding is the idea that I push you, you push me, whoever's the bigger, stronger person with the most leverage eventually is going to push the other person over. But with yielding, instead of us trying to see who the bigger meathead is, when you push me, I get out of the way of that force and now I can respond with less effort. So I'm not trying to butt heads with you and see if I'm bigger and stronger than you. Now, it's obvious how this can be beneficial in athletics or in the combat sports because oftentimes we come up against individuals who are bigger than stronger than us. And so learning how to yield to their force can help us get an advantage. And in order to be good at physical yielding, a lot of things have to come into play. One, you need to be well-rooted. The lower part of your body needs to be strong and flexible so you can change your central equilibrium without getting tight. The body has to be relaxed. The breath has to be calm. And the mind has to be present. Now, it takes years and years to be able to do this under pressure. But from day one, by incorporating these meditation practices, we start to develop a sense of awareness in ourselves that helps us see things a lot more clearly than it ever did before. And once we start to develop this awareness, we also develop a higher sense of awareness in how these things are affecting other people. And this is where we move into what I call mental yielding. And mental yielding, say for example, I say something that unsettles you and I pick up on it right from the beginning. It's a lot easier to adjust the conversation and keep us in a happy place than if I'm not paying attention to that pretty soon, I'm so far off track, you want to slap me upside the head. And so learning how to use yielding in all of our interactions is extremely powerful. I mean, one, you're just being more considerate, which is something we should all do anyway. And two, it allows you to be strategic. And this works in our relationships, it works in business and sales and negotiations. If you can guide a conversation to a positive outcome with the least amount of resistance, think about the headaches that can save you. And so it's a very powerful concept that's very strategic in many different ways. Then the last style of yielding is what I call emotional yielding. And emotional yielding is very much like mental yielding, but it's with our own interpersonal conflicts. So you think about oftentimes something will happen to us and we'll respond and we'll go down this path. And we might get an hour, a day, a week down that road and realize maybe that wasn't the best choice. But with yielding and our expanded awareness through practicing these meditative arts, we're able to see something more clearly from the beginning and make those adjustments before it gains too much negative momentum in any one direction. And a lot of times helps us make a more educated decision. And you know, I, I've been explaining this idea of yielding now for well over 30 years. I've been running the academy here. And one of the most common things I'll hear people say is, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I use yielding all the time. And while I would agree that everybody uses some degree of yielding all the time. It's kind of like if you or I were to walk into a crime scene with a detective who's been on the job for 30 years, he would see things about the series of events and the timeline that I know at least I would have no clue of. The meditative arts helps us see things inside of ourselves and inside of other people that I truly believe that you could never have that kind of awareness without having a meditation practice. I think that's a great way of describing it is like, I'm not a big, I'm not a fan. I've listened to a few on recommendations, but I'm not a fan of true crime podcasts, but some people it's their jam. Um, you know, you do you, but I, I can imagine someone's like, I've listened to all these true crime podcasts. I'm ready, as you said, compared to going in with somebody who is like a detective and they've been trained to do that. But there would be people who are more naturally observant or more naturally. I know that, you know, visually I'm not an observant person. Listen, listen I'm a good listener. But in terms of if you gave me pictures, like there was that, there was this one 
YouTube video once it was a sensation and they went through it and then they ask you how many differences can you spot? Like you didn't know you were looking beforehand, so you weren't cued in. And there was like 30 changes. I think I noticed two, like the color of the drapes in the background and something else, but they had like completely different actors and everything. So, you know, not an observant person. I know that, but like with any skill, as you said, you can, you can practice it. And with guidance for which parts to tune into, which parts to pay attention to, which parts to hone. And I love how you mentioned that it has, you know, physical, mental and emotional aspects because yeah, sometimes you can be having a conversation with something, someone, and you can say something and you can notice or pick up from their body language, from their tone, from the way they change the subject. Is it a chance then to interject or to just let it go? And then six months later, they're like, do you remember when? And you have no idea, like, because I I don't remember all this stuff. So to practice these things, to, you know, hone these skills sounds very, very valuable for people. So if people are like, okay, I want to know more about this yielding, where do they find your book? They can find a free copy of my book on my website at theyieldingwarrior.com forward slash book. And they could get a free copy there. And also at that same website, just theyieldingwarrior.com, you can check out our online program and our teacher training program. If you're somebody maybe who is running a yoga studio or a martial arts academy, or maybe you're a life coach and you want to add another pillar to your business, um, you can look into that as well. Perfect. So the the yieldingwarrior.com and then the yieldingwarrior.com forward slash book, I'll put it in the show notes. I was also going to say for listeners, I know a lot of you are Kindle Unlimited avid readers because we talk about what we're reading often. You can grab it there. And it's also on Audible, I noticed. So if you are like me and prefer to listen to things, you can grab a copy of it. Um, on Audible. And if people are wanting to know more about working with you, do I know that you are in Portland, but you said online. So you teach this online as well? Yeah. So I have an online program at theyieldingwarrior.com that teaches how to build an evolving life practice around the meditative arts, using things from the movement practices, from breath work, from sitting meditation, standing meditation, and really understanding the science behind it. Because it is such a deep practice and there's so many different directions that you can take it. Having a guided approach to help you accomplish different things because within the meditative arts, you know, I didn't mention this earlier, but there's five different directions that people usually will practice meditation. There is more the athletic side or the combative side. There's the therapeutic side, the medical side, the philosophical side, and then also the meditative or spiritual side. And not everybody is drawn to the meditative arts for the same reason. And so, for example, if you were to come to me, I wouldn't prescribe the exact same things as maybe somebody who was coming here because they wanted to improve their performance on the football field. And so we would have different things that we would focus on. And again, having a guide to kind of help you pick and choose what things will work for you is, is very helpful. And if anyone, I do have a mix of listeners. I have entrepreneurs. I have traditionally employed people. If Do you have two streams as in people who want to practice just for themselves versus people who want to train to add it to their product suite? Or is it the same regardless path that they would do working with you? It's two separate paths. Um, so here at the Academy, we have four different programs and just the internal arts or the meditative portion of the academy produces around 35 to forty thousand dollars a month with only taking about seven to ten hours a week into our schedule and so somebody who has a yoga studio or a martial arts studio and they want to tap into a different market because usually the people that are coming in for like Tai Chi and Qigong aren't the same people that are coming in for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or coming in for Ashtanga Yoga. And so if you want to tap into another resource where you can utilize some of that empty class time you have and have a program that could add a substantial amount of income to your bottom line, it's a great way to do it. And it's also something that adds a lot of value to your current clients, even if maybe that's not their main focus. I love that. And I think that's something really valuable to consider because if you, as you said, if you do have 
a yoga studio or a gym or, you know, whatever place, a physical location where you offer classes and then you have downtime in between to have something that could be of benefit to your current clients that, you know, benefits them in a different way or to bring in a new clientele who wouldn't have otherwise attended your place because they don't um, do that. I know a local yoga studio here near where I live recently added hot yoga, like they have a new setup for that and everything and had a significant more people come in because that's what they wanted. So to diversify your offerings, it sounds like something that people could do. And if people don't have a business, but they just want to do meditation for personal practice, you have offerings for that as well on your website? Yes. Cool. All right. So it sounds like check out the yieldingwarrior.com and choose your own adventure. I love that. And before we wrap up, um, Jeff, any final words for anyone who's listening who's kind of like, yeah, I know, because we, we get this, we're like, yeah, I know, but like to actually take that action step because as you said you came into this quite young and I loved how you were like yeah no isn't that for old people but because you had so much trust in that person you were like following that guidance but for people who kind of feel the call but never have actually taken that step what anything advice you'd have for them yeah I'd like to say one thing that maybe could push you over the edge and that is you know I've had over 26,000 students come through my academy and every time somebody new comes in here that's thinking about starting with the meditative practices, if they listen to what I'm telling them to do, and that is incorporate a daily ritual and integrate some of these active practices into their day, and they stick with that and do that every day for a year, I would be willing to bet that 95 to 98% of those people will do this practice for the rest of their life because they'll see so many benefits from the practice that they would be crazy to stop. It's the ones that don't find that why and don't put that effort from the beginning. They're the ones that are kind of flaky and coming in and out of things and, and not really seeing that. So if you want to do it and you believe there's value there, make the commitment to yourself to do it for a year. Just put put it in there and I guarantee you it'll be one of the best decisions you've ever made. I think that is that is such valuable advice because sometimes we know that the thing we want to do, we want to do for life, but it seems daunting to commit to life, like with so many things. But if you commit to a year and then you feel like how will you feel a year from now, mentally, energetically, physically. And as you said, once you feel like that, you keep doing it. When I started this podcast, I committed to doing it for a year daily. Uh, it's not daily anymore. I've changed the amount, but I still will do the podcast. It might change and your practice might change where, you know, the way that you do meditation or the different tools or styles that you utilize might change. But the fact that you know that you get benefit from it, I will podcast in some way, shape or form, I imagine for a very long time, maybe even life, but that commitment to doing it for a year, who I became as a result of it, not necessarily the business thing. Like sometimes people, the first thing, how many clients did you get or how many downloads did you have or all this? And it's like, isn't that interesting? And, and imagine like with meditation, if people come to it from more a fitness thing, how much weight did you lose or how much can you lift now? And it's like on the other side of that year, those, what I <laughs> lovingly say, vanity stats aren't as important as who you become along the way. So I love that. It's like, yeah, commit to it for a year and then see what happens. And then from there, like you, you just keep going. It's like trying to think of things like brushing your teeth when you're a small child. I've got, my kids are older now, but trying to, <laughs> trying to talk them into that for the first few years was very challenging. And now it's like, I can't go to sleep yet. I haven't brushed my teeth. Imagine if meditation was like that for you. It's just like, it doesn't feel right today because I haven't done my practice. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, Jeff. This has been very, very valuable. Thank you everyone for listening. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now.